As you know, I'm dealing with life in the spirit, life in the spirit, and this is part number 10 of life in the spirit, and my subtitle is the spirit's power, the spirit's power, and, and by the spirit's power, I'm not talking about necessarily about the Holy Spirit, but I'm talking about the power of your spirit. The life of the believer is a spirit life. That means it is a life that is lived through the spirit and not the flesh. The Holy Spirit lives in the spirit of the believer. When we say that the Holy Spirit lives in us, he doesn't live in our flesh, he doesn't live in our soul, he lives in our spirit. And the Holy Spirit reveals himself through the spirit of the believer. The Holy Spirit works through the spirit of the believer. The Holy Spirit ministers through the spirit of the believer. And the Holy Spirit speaks through the spirit of the believer. God himself is a spirit. We live our lives in the spirit. And God's promises to us are always to our spirit. So it's always important to know who is the spirit man and to understand what the spirit man has, the power he has, so we can live the life that God wants for us. Just before I get into my main um, teaching, just uh, a reference from Luke chapter 10, verse 17 and, uh, and to 19. Jesus said to the 70 who had returned after going to do his work, uh, the Bible says, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I want you to know to that. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. This is the promise of Jesus to us. And it's a promise he makes to us, not to your flesh, but to your spirit, that we have power over every power of the enemy. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Uh, the, 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 the Greek tense is an imperfect tense. And, and so if, uh, if you read it literally, uh, it would sound like, I was seeing Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I was seeing. Uh, so the impression you get from that verse is that when Jesus sent the 70 to go and do his work, although he was not physically present with them, he was spiritually with them. And, and he, he was watching what was going on. So he says, when, when, said, when you were casting out the demons, I saw it. When you were praying for the sick, I saw it. And, and I saw Satan's defeat uh, through your ministry. Anytime believers go out to minister, Jesus goes with us. And he goes with us into the camp of the enemy. And that's why we don't fear enemy territory. That's why we can boldly go into any place where demons are. Because he gives us power over all the power of the enemy. Somebody say, I have power. All right. Now, that power is in your spirit. And it's important that we, we, we understand the power in our spirit. And that is what drove Paul to pray. And he records a prayer that he, he prayed for the Ephesians uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 15 to 13. And this is what the Apostle Paul says, Therefore I also, after I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What's he praying about when Paul says, I'm praying for the believers? What is he praying about? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling 
And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. It's a very long sentence, but I'll try to break it down. Paul is basically talking about God's power. And he says that God's power is exceedingly great. Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? God's power is exceedingly great. The word exceeding means that it surpasses everything. There is nothing in this created order that is greater than God's power. Nothing. God's power is exceeding. It surpasses everything in greatness. So when we're dealing with, the, with God's power, we're dealing with the greatest power ever imaginable in the universe. There is nothing greater than the power of God. Not the power of the sun, not the power of constellations somewhere, not the power of planets, not the power of atoms, not the power of chemicals. God's power is exceeding. Not the power of demons, not the power of Satan. God's power exceeds in greatness. So when you're dealing with God's power, you have to know what power you're dealing with. You're dealing with exceeding great power. Somebody say exceeding and great. Say with me, God's power is exceeding and great. That's what the passage says. God's power is exceeding and God's power is great. Now, if there is such great power, the question we ask is, whom does it work for? Whom does God's power work for? What, where is the power of God focused? So we have to know whom it works for. The power of God is great. If it's against you, you are in trouble. If it's for you, you are in good shape. So whom is this power working for? And, and the passage answers it. It says it works for those who believe. It is toward us who believe. So this exceeding power of God, this great power of God is working whom is it working for? It's working for those who believe in Jesus Christ. It's not working against us. It's working for us. Because if God's power is working against you, you have no chance. You have no chance. Just throw in the towel, surrender. If God is against you, you are gone. But thank God, his power is not against you, but his power is for you. His power is working towards you. So Paul says there is exceedingly great power of God. Whom is it working for? It's working for those who believe in Jesus Christ. You and I who are believers born again. Then he talks about the proof of the power. What is the proof of this power? This power that Paul is talking about, that he says is exceeding great, that is towards us, he gives us the proof of the power. And the proof is that this power worked in Jesus Christ. This power worked in Jesus Christ. This is God's proof of concept. God's power at work in the spirit of Christ. So we, if we want to see how God's power works, we have to see how that power worked in the life of Jesus Christ. 
It is the power that worked in Jesus Christ when he was alive. It is the power that worked in Jesus Christ when he died. But Paul doesn't focus much on the power at work in Jesus when he was alive. He talked about more about the power that worked in Jesus when he died. Now, Jesus was crucified on the cross and he died. We know that. He died on the cross. Before Jesus died, he prayed and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So, Jesus died, but his spirit didn't die. His spirit was still alive. Spirit was not affected by death. Of course, no human being's spirit dies when they die. Uh, but Jesus was very careful about committing his spirit into the hands of the Father. So, although Jesus was physically dead, his spirit was not dead. And this exceeding power that we talked about, this exceeding power was still at work in the spirit of Jesus. Body is dead. But the spirit has exceeding power in it. I want you to think about it. The body is dead. But the spirit has exceeding power in it. The body is dead and buried in a tomb. And a stone is rolled up the tomb. But the spirit is alive. And the spirit has exceeding power of God working in it. In the spirit of Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying that this exceeding power, the proof is that it worked in Jesus. How did it work in Jesus? It says it raised him from the dead. It raised him from the dead. Now, it may seem like a very simple thing. But when a person dies, all their physical functions stop. The heart stops beating. Brain, dead. Liver, dead. Kidney, dead. Cells, dead. Everything is dead. But the Bible says that this power that was still in the spirit of Jesus Christ raised this dead body back to life. To raise the body back to life, this exceeding power in the spirit of Christ activated the dead cells of his body so that what was considered ended came back to life. But that's not all. When he raised the body of Jesus Christ from the dead, he didn't raise it up to be like the body as it was before he died. He raised it up into another form called a glorified body. So the spirit in Christ activated the body of Christ and turned it into a different kind of body, a glorified body that can walk through walls and walk outside of walls, be in one place at one time and be in another place at another time. And all of this is because the exceeding power is still at work in the spirit of Jesus Christ, activating his body. I want you to follow this carefully because we're going to land somewhere. So, Paul is saying... I pray that the eyes of your understanding will, you will get this. I pray you will get it. What do you get? That there is exceeding power that is working towards you. You say, what is that kind of power? This is the kind of power. What did it do? It raised Jesus from the dead. It raised him. It activated his body. It revived his body. It transformed his body. It made him alive. That power is at work inside you. And not only did the power raise Jesus from the dead, he says that that power seated Jesus far above all powers, 
all principalities, all authority, all dominion, all might. How did it happen? Because there was something working inside of Jesus that activated his body, lifted him up, seated him far above all principality. And not only that, subjected all forces under his feet. And how did it work? Because of the exceeding greatness of God's power. Where was the power working? In Jesus. How did it work? It raised him from the dead. And another way, it seated him above and subjected him to all power. So we see the proof of this concept of the spirit in our spirit and what it does to the body of Jesus Christ. The question is, can what happened in Jesus be replicated? Did it only happen to Jesus? Can it work in our lives also? Jesus proved that it is possible for those who have partaken of human nature to be seated at the right hand of the Father. It is possible for those who have once partaken of human nature to be lifted up above all principality and power. And he didn't do it for himself because Jesus didn't need that. Before he became flesh, he already had power over all principalities and power. He was already above them. What he came to do is to prove whether flesh and blood can have that power. That's why he became flesh and blood to demonstrate that it, it can happen. So after it happens, now he has to see how he can duplicate what has happened to him in the life of all human beings who believe in him and trust him. That this same exceeding power can work in their spirits and do for them what it did for Jesus Christ. So the question is, where is this exceeding power now? The same Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Somebody say, the power is at work in me. Say it one more time. Say it like you believe it. Don't know the power is at work in me. What, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Was the power at work in Jesus? How did it function in Jesus? When Jesus died, this power raised him from the dead. Seated him above all principality and power. Subjected all powers to him. This power that was in Jesus, the scripture says, is now at work in us. Is it not working in your head? Working in your spirit. At work in your spirit. So what will it do in our spirits. What does this power do in our spirits? Romans chapter 8 verse 11. Oh, I love this. Romans 8, 11. But if, everybody say if. You know what if is? If is a conditional statement. If means there is a provision. There is a condition. If you meet the condition, this is what it, you get. So it says, but if, but if, if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, if there's the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwell in you? It's a question. Okay. If, everybody say if. If what? The spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. Question. Does he who, does the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwell in you? Are you sure? The spirit of him who raised Christ 
is not just sitting in heaven, but dwells in you. Do you accept that? Is that a fact? Is it something you believe with all your heart? Then you have, you have answered the if. The condition is met. So if you have met the condition, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. How is he going to do it? Through his spirit who dwells in you. So his spirit who dwells in you, where does he dwell? In your spirit. Because his spirit dwells in you, his spirit will do to your body what the spirit did to the body of Christ. Are you following that? <laughs> if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he does dwell in me, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also, everybody say also, also means in addition. In addition to what? In addition to what he did in Christ. He did it for Christ. Will also, in addition, give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Very profound statement. What does it mean? It means that the spirit in us, your spirit, joined to the spirit of Christ, guarantees us first and foremost a resurrected body. This is the ultimate work of our spirits. One day, if Christ tarries, we will die. One day, not now. Not tomorrow, not this year, not next year, not next 10 years. But one day, one day, 200 years from now. <laughs> okay, one day. But even 200 years, it will still happen. But one day you will die. This passage says, if the spirit of Christ dwells in you, then what the spirit did to the body of Christ, will he will do to you. Why? Because your spirit will not die at death. And your spirit, alive, still has the power of God in it. It's still joined to Christ. Your spirit will never be separated from Christ. Remember what Paul says? For what shall separate us from the love of God? Neither life, nor death, nor things present, nor principle. Nothing. You are joined to Christ permanently. So, when you die, your spirit is still joined to Christ. And the scripture says that when Christ is coming, there will be a trumpet sound. And the dead in Christ will rise. How is that going to happen? Because your spirit is going to look for its body. In whatever form that body was in, decomposed, cremated, buried, fossilized, but the spirit is going to say, that's what I used to live in and call it back into service. And so the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise. It says that the, the sea will give up the dead, the land will give up the dead, fire will give up its dead because nobody can permanently destroy matter and your body is matter. And your spirit is going to activate that body, your mortal body. So what is going to happen? Your spirit then says, I am back to service. Wherever the body is, if you were cut into pieces and thrown all over the world, every piece will gather. But not only that, your spirit will do to your body what the spirit of Jesus did to his body will transform your body into another body. So when the trumpet sounds, whereas this body cannot levitate and go up, that body that will be reassembled will be a glorified body. When the spirit hears the sound, the master is coming instantly. 
It puts your body into motion, transforms your body, and you are raised with him. And this operation, the Bible says, it shall happen in the twinkling of an eye. It's not going to take days. In one moment, everybody, every believer, your body is going to come from wherever it is. In whatever form it comes together, it forms and then transforms and then rises with you. And that is happening because the spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And because he dwells in you, he quickens your mortal body just as he quickened the mortal body of Jesus Christ. Are you following me? But not only that, that's the ultimate, but the spirit in us also grants us power over our fleshly desires because your mortal body is a bad boy. So what does the spirit want to do? This same spirit wants to help you gain mastery over your body and its desires and its appetites so that the flesh will not rule over you. So sin will not rule over you. So the exceeding greatness of God's power at work in you is helping you to overcome the desires of the flesh. It's helping you. The third thing, that same spirit will generate divine health in your body. Now, the last two people, people say, but pastor, if the spirit is supposed to help me have power by my flesh, why is my flesh mis misbehaving? Why am I doing all these things I don't want to do? And how come I'm sick? Paul prayed and says that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened that you may know. When God has put his life in your spirit and your spirit is giving you life, you cannot speak death to yourself because when you do that, you are contradicting the work of the spirit inside of your body. You cannot speak sickness. Oh, I am sick. Ah, whew, the way I'm feeling, I think I'm going to be sick this week. Uh, so many times, God is giving us health, but our lips are contradicting what our spirit is giving to us. That is why your spirit, your soul, your thoughts, your imaginations must be in agreement so the life of the spirit will be manifested in your body. God is constantly renewing our bodies. He gave us a body that should live a long time on earth. He gave us that body. Our body is not designed for short-term living. Our bodies are designed for long-term living. Some say 70, some say 80, some say 120. Whatever it is, it's not supposed to be short. And how are we going to sustain our bodies by the spirit that is in us. So our words must be in agreement with our spirit. When your spirit says you are overcoming, you say I'm overcoming. When your spirit says you are healed, you don't say I'm sick, you say I am healed. When your spirit says you are strong, you don't say I'm weak. You must acknowledge the work of the spirit inside of you. And in conclusion, I'm going to show you how the Apostle Paul lived out that life. Second Corinthians. Chapter 4, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. Second Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What is the treasure? The spirit, the spirit infused with the spirit of God. We have this treasure. And where do we have this, the treasure? In earthen vessels, in our bodies, earthen vessels. This body is weak. 
It is subject to decay. It is subject to all kinds of vicissitudes. And as you grow older, your body begins to tell you, I am going where I'm going. You go where you want to go. So the body is an earthen vessel. It weakens. It doesn't get strong. But within the weakness of your body, you have a treasure. And this treasure is the spirit that God gave you in which dwells the spirit that raised Christ from the dead. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in your spirit and your spirit lives in your body, which is an earthen vessel. So how are we supposed to live, to live our lives? How did Paul manage the conflict between the spirit living in him and his earthen vessels? So this is what he says. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. So what is he saying? He's making a declaration. Life is hard, but I'm not crushed. So Paul, if Paul is living in Ghana, he will not say, hey, it's hard or we will all die. No, life is hard. We will not crush. I am hard pressed, but this is not my end. So he said, persecuted, but not no, no, I'm not up to persecute. Yet not cross. We are perplexed, but not in despair. The city is perplexing us. But because I have the spirit in my earthen vessel, I am not in despair. I will overcome this one too. I will win over this one too. Because I have the spirit in me. I feel it in my body, but I'm coming out victorious over this. That's Paul. That's how he allows the spirit in him to conquer the flesh. Persecuted. Not forsaken. Struck down. Not destroyed. It knocks me down. I'm getting up. Knocks me down. I'm getting up. That sickness came against my body. I'm getting up. This is not taking me to my grave. I'm getting up. Struck down, but not destroyed. Then listen to how he concludes it. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. What does it mean, always carrying about the body of Christ. Because Jesus in his body took our sickness. He took our infirmity. That sickness, that headache, it was on Jesus. That fever, it was on Jesus. That problem you have in your bone, it was on Jesus. That problem you have in your liver, it was on Jesus. Paul says, I am conscious that Jesus in his body took all of these things. And because his spirit lives in me, I don't carry that. I carry the life that he has made available to me. And where is the life of Christ? The life of Christ is in his spirit. And where is the spirit of Christ? The spirit of Christ is in your spirit. And where is in your spirit? In an earthen vessel, subjected to pain and all kinds of vicissitudes of life. But because there is treasure inside of you, you will not be crushed. You will overcome. Because the spirit which raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And if that spirit dwells in you, then just as he did for Christ, he will also do for you. And because of the spirit in us, we overcome every challenge of life. Somebody say, I am an overcomer. Say, I'm a, I'm a winner. If you want your spirit to assert himself in you, agree with him. You don't go through life saying, hey, this thing is killing us all. This thing is killing us. Hey, I don't know. Hey, man, it's breaking me. I don't think I'll survive this. I don't think I'll make it. Oh, 
If you say that, you are in contradiction with your spirit. And how can two walk together except they be agreed? You have to come into agreement with your spirit and walk in the fullness of life that has been deposited by Christ into your spirit. And there is a spirit in you right now quickening you, quickening your body. In the name of Jesus, every sickness in your body responds to the quickening power of the spirit at work in you. Your body comes back to life. Your body receives new life. Your body receives new strength. Pain disappears. Viruses are destroyed. Bacteria are destroyed. Cells that have been broken are being worked together. There is a spirit in you quickening your body. Receive what he's doing. There is a spirit in you repairing your body. Receive what he's doing. There is a spirit in you making you strong. Receive what he's doing. And constantly declare it. Constantly be like Paul. Make a declaration of what the treasure inside you is accomplishing in your body. I declare over your life total healing and health from every disease, from every pain. What was considered impossible will be made possible in your case. You've never been pregnant before. You will be pregnant. In the name of Jesus, you've never had a child. You will have a child in the name of Jesus. Your body is coming full circle into the fullness of the blessing. 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 Just somebody lift up your hands and receive it. 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 Receive it now. Receive it now. By the Spirit. At work in your spirit. In Jesus' name. And we give you praise. We give you glory, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah!